Hey, everybody. Brian Kenny here. It's MLB Now Home Edition. Today, we're joined by Keith Law of The Athletic, who has a new book that is out today, The Inside Game, Bad Calls, Strange Moves, and What Baseball Behavior Teaches Us About Ourselves. How are you doing, Keith? I'm good, thanks. How are you? This is right up our alley, Keith. This is, uh, this is our show. Yes. <laughs> this, is what, this is what we do. Yes. So, um, a fascinating topic. Um, let's start a little broad on this. Um, you call it illusory, uh, illusory correlation. It's kind of that drive for narrative. What, like, as you're like, kind of forming your opinions about baseball and you're getting mm -hmm. into it, what was, um, like, what was your entry point into? Hey, wait a second. Are we looking at the right things here? I probably was aware of some of this stuff, uh, you know, just on a like a subtle level, aware of it without being aware of what I was noticing necessarily. Like, you know, I knew, say, what recency bias was just in the sense that, hey, you don't always just look at what a player did in the last month or the last half season or maybe even the last whole season, but didn't have the names for these things, didn't necessarily have the tools to be able to think about it kind of more structurally and figure out, okay, well, what do I need to do when writing about players or especially writing about big decisions, transactions, trades and free agent signings or in-game tactics? How do I make sure that I'm not falling prey to these traps and am better able to notice when the people I'm writing about are falling into these traps? And I mentioned in the book too that Sig Medjal from the, now with the Baltimore Orioles, he was with the Astros at the time, recommended a book called Thinking Fast and Slow to Me and said, everyone we bring into the Astros front office, we ask them to read this book because it just helps you think about thinking. And I read the book and it's a little on the dense side, but really liked what I read there and noticed that I was doing all of these things. Of course I am, I'm human. We're, our brains have evolved to make all of these mistakes. It's how our brains process all the information coming at us and have just continued to read up on the topic, both popular books and some academic literature over the last I don't know, six years now, and eventually had this idea to maybe use baseball examples to illuminate some of these concepts for more of a mass audience for folks who may not read Kahneman's book because it's kind of written for a different group. Um, so what, what's most prevalent? Again, which, which thing happens uh, that's most prevalent in baseball that you say, why does that keep happening? Uh, boy, there's a couple of them. Um, we're very prey to outcome bias in baseball and in life. But the idea that um, we judge a process by its outcome, did it work or didn't it work? I mean, that's constant. I don't know how much you're like, interacting with fans on social media, but when I do maybe during a playoff game or something and say, oh, they shouldn't have bunted there, someone, if the runner ended up scoring, someone will say, but it worked. Therefore, it was a good move. That it, we're just wired to judge things that way. I go into it at length, the example of Bob Brenly in the 2001 World Series, who kept doing the wrong thing. And then Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling show up and they're, they're Superman and Batman and they save the whole series. And suddenly Bob Brenly is a World Series winning manager. No, he did everything wrong that week. He, was, he batted Tony Womack leadoff. He constantly bunted in front of Luis Gonzalez. He kept running Young Hyung Kim out there to face left-handed batters. These were all bad decisions. His process was bad. The outcome was good for the team as a whole. We can have that conversation and say, yes, they won the World Series. However, the manager's process was bad. Judging a process just by the outcome, that's outcome bias. And I think it's one of the easiest ones in the book for people to understand because we all do that. Separating process from outcome is actually difficult for us. And you kind of have to retrain your brain to think that way. I know, Keith, when I was writing my book, it was that last year while I was writing it, I was like, Oh no, everybody's getting smart, like right now. <laughs> like, like, you know, in the, so in the last few years, how mm -hmm. much of this has changed for you? That, and now you're writing it this year, how mm -hmm. much has changed where baseball has gotten much smarter? So I had that worry more with the first book, with Smart Baseball, which is that I'm writing this kind of as you were. We were writing in the same sphere, right? And in real time, we're watching the world get smarter, the baseball world especially, both the front office side and the media side. So to the point our books came out pretty close to each other, it sounds like you had the same fear I did. It's, wait, people are going to read this book and say, yeah, I, I already know a lot of this stuff. Now, it turns out we live a little bit in a bubble, right, where there are plenty of people outside of our sphere who didn't know a lot of that stuff or appreciated that you and I were trying to get after, explain these things in different terms. Whereas with this book, the one nice thing, and I will sort of say my publisher keeps saying, we, we think this will have a long tail in sales because – Everybody suffers from these biases. It's a product of evolution. It doesn't matter how smart you are, how educated you are. If you're human, 
you fall prey to recency bias or outcome <clears throat> bias because our brains are, again, have just evolved to do that stuff. And it becomes, you're not rewiring your brain, you're changing your process so that you know, oh, I'm still overreacting to the fact that Joey Bag of Donuts has hit 400 since the All-Star break. You have to stop and think, well, is that real? What other data can I look at that might answer is, is he actually a better hitter now than I thought he was? Or are we just looking at some random noise in the stats? Let me ask you a specific question because I've asked this of, uh, excuse me, baseball people Mm -hmm. and I haven't really tackled it. Has draft, since baseball has gotten more codified and they've gotten smarter and scouting Mm -hmm. has has changed dramatically, has drafting gotten smarter or actually have, have drafting results gotten better? I think so in certain ways. And I had a conversation with, uh, when, when the proposal came out that Major League Baseball is probably going to shorten the draft this year, and it could be as short as five rounds. Um, I'm hoping they stick to about 10 rounds. That's another topic. But one of the assistant GMs I spoke to said, we don't need 30 rounds anymore because drafting is more efficient. You're not getting that random college reliever in the 22nd round anymore. It turns out to be a good big leaguer. He goes in the seventh round. So we don't need to go as deep because there's greater efficiency because those, especially those small college players, because of statistical analysis, we find those guys sooner. So that's one particular way I do think it's gotten smarter. However, I have all chapter in the book where I talk about high school pitchers in the first round being such a poor decision overall because the, the, the base rate that high school pitchers taken in the first round fail at a higher rate than other categories we still take too many of those guys. In fact, until last year, I had one of those moments last June as I'm writing the book and the first 17 picks, there's no high school pitcher taken. I'm like, oh, wait, did, did they all just figure this out while I'm writing the chapter? Like is some, who's in the room right now as I'm trying to explain this? I don't think we've gotten there yet, but I will say in the, just in the last couple of days, because the athletic ran part of that chapter as an excerpt, one scouting director said, now I'm taking a high school pitcher in the first round just to spite you. The book, The Inside Game, is out now. Keith Law. Keith, uh, throw this one thing in. Remember, the season's on pause, but 30 players are putting their virtual talents to the test on MLB The Show 20. That's the Players League. You can catch the recap of the matchups tonight, 7 Eastern on MLB Network, because you got to play video baseball at least right now or read about baseball. Keith, we'll do it again. We'll dig a little deeper. Thanks a lot. My pleasure.